We are very delighted to welcome Emmanuel Saez here at Princeton uh, to talk about his new book, The Triumph of Injustice, written together with Gabriel Suckman. Um, I imagine many of you are already quite familiar with Emmanuel's uh, career and his work, but for those of you who aren't, I'm going to say a few words uh, about Emmanuel before he takes the floor. Um, so since receiving his PhD in 1999 at MIT, Emmanuel has worked on a range of questions related to tax policy and uh, inequality. Together with uh, Thomas Piketty uh, and more recently Gabriel Suckman, uh, Emmanuel has worked on investigating the long-run historical revolution of income and wealth inequality in the US and in other countries as well. Um, as you probably know, this work has had an enormous amount of influence, both inside and outside uh, economics. In fact, I think the very focus on the top 1% income shares and wealth shares, um, very central in the public debate about in inequality today, has a lot to do with the work by Emmanuel and his collaborators. Um, Emmanuel's 2003 QGE paper with Thomas Piketty documenting uh, top income shares in the US over almost a century is an incredibly cited paper. I think it has more than 4,000 Google Scholar citations, which is quite stunning, actually. And his recent papers on income and wealth inequality are incredibly cited as well. Um, so the impact of this work shows how deeply people care about inequality, presumably because of the many interesting uh, normative questions it, ra it raises related to fairness uh, and redistribution. And in their new book, Emmanuel and Gabriel dives into precisely these normative questions. Um, Emmanuel has received many of the most prestigious awards of our profession. Um, in 2009, he was the recipient of a John Bates Clark Medal uh, given every year, or I think actually at that time only every second year, to a US-based economist under the age of 40. In 2010, he was the recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship. Um, his work has been hugely influential in the field of public economics as a whole, it's really shaped the trajectory uh, of public economics over the last two decades, in my mind, more so than the work of any other researcher in the field during this uh, time period. Okay, so I could go on talking about Emmanuel for a long time, um, but I will keep this brief. Um, I, again, I'm very excited about hearing Emmanuel's uh, presentation about this book. Um, the book has been uh, my bedtime reading uh, over the last couple of days. Um, it may sound surprising to you that a book about taxes can be bedtime reading, um, <laughs> unless the purpose is to fall asleep. Um, but that didn't happen in this case because the book is really extremely well written. It kept me awake as well as intrigued. Uh, if you haven't already done so, I strongly recommend that you read the book. Um, and so with this, I will invite Emmanuel onto the floor. The plan is for Emmanuel to talk for 45 minutes uh, about his book, and then following that, we'll have uh, about 30 minutes of Q&A. All right? The floor is yours, Emmanuel. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Henrik, for this very generous uh, introduction. So I'm delighted to be here at Princeton tonight to talk about our book with Gabriel Zuckman, The Triumph of Injustice, describing the current situation, but also hope for the future, taxjusticenow.org, which is a website that allows you to think boldly about taxes uh, for the future. So uh, our book has uh, three main novelties. So first, using data we've compiled uh, over the years, it describes how much each social group pays in taxes from the early 20th century to uh, today. That is, we divide the US population by income groups. We include all taxes at the state, local, and federal level, and we measure uh, the tax burden. So it tells that those are the underlying uh, data, and we tell the story of how We've come to be where we are. But the second part of the book uh, proposes uh, elements for a new 21st century tax uh, system with the idea of reconciling globalization and progressive taxation. So if there is one message that you should take from our book is that uh, progressive taxation is possible if we want to do it 
we can do it. Globalization is not something that inherently prevents us from uh, adopting progressive policies. So to follow up on this, we've created tools for a democratic fiscal debate at taxjusticenow.org, where you can explore what we propose in terms of tax reforms, where you can visualize what the main candidates in the democratic primary are proposing, and you can modify all of those plans to craft uh, your favorite tax system. So uh, what I want to say uh, is that all the figures, data, computer code, technical background papers are available on the website. So if there are you know, people here really interested in the details, please go online, look at the data, play with it, and give us, uh, give us uh, a feedback. So as any academic enterprise, numbers are never definitive in the sense that we try to approximate you know, to the best of our judgment, our understanding, the, you know, leveraging the best data uh, uh, we can, but we see it as one element in the debate. So if you followed the Twitter wars, you know there has been already uh, a critique. So here I want to place myself in a longer time frame. You know, this is not going to be decided within uh, one week. And I invite you know, all scholars to look carefully at the data and you know, so that we can shape a uh, better measurement of inequality and better measurement of taxes for the uh, future. So uh, we start the book by describing what we call the regressivity of the current uh, US tax uh, system. So what we do uh, in the book is to offer a comprehensive view of the US tax system post uh, the Trump tax reforms. That is how our taxes and tax rates distributed after the big uh, Trump uh, tax cut. And we are going to consider all tax paid at all levels of governments in 2018. So we've been criticized. How can you know already you know what's happening in 2018? Well, we've used current data projections, you know, in some extent to uh, create you know, what we think is the best approximation to what we know. If you wait for government agencies, you probably wouldn't know what's happened you know, in 2018 after the presidential uh, election of 2020. And we think you know, voters uh, deserve to know to the best of our understanding uh, what is uh, going on. And so uh, what do we find? So let me show you uh, the graph. So this type of graph, so we have many like this uh, in the book where we rank all individual adults in the United States by income groups. So starting from the bottom 10% here, the second decile, and so on, all the way to the top. And at the top, we break down the top 1% uh, into final groups so that they are exploded. Uh, in this view, they look a lot bigger than they are population-wide, but they look big as they are in terms of their weight in the economy, the income share they earn. And then on the y-axis, uh, we depict the average tax rates by income groups as a percent of true pre-tax comprehensive income. So one innovation we do here is that we measure income much more comprehensively than what had been done uh, before, it's not only the income you report on your tax return, but it also captures forms of income that go untaxed. So think about the fringe benefits you get from Princeton University, you know, healthcare uh, insurance. If you own stock, it's the corporate profits, you know, that the corporations uh, uh, make uh, uh, on the stock, and that's going to be uh, counted. So it's a wide denominator, and in the numerator, it's all taxes, state, local and federal. And so what you can see in this picture very clearly is that the working class, you know, pays something like 25 percent, the bottom uh, 50 percent, which is only slightly lower than the average economy wide, where in the U.S. total taxes are 28 percent of uh, national income. So there is mild progressivity, the middle class pays a little bit more, the upper middle class similarly more, so then some increase among the rich, and then what is striking and what we wanted you know, to document clearly is how uh, there is regressivity when you really zoom in 
at the very top of the distribution. So here our smallest group are the top 400, and you can think about them as the billionaires, as they are described in Forbes magazine, the, the list of the richest uh, Americans. And so you can see uh, that the regressivity is visible. You know, that is the top 400 pay a rate that we estimate in 2018 of only about 23% relative to their true economic income, not just the income they report on their tax return, but all the profits you know, of corporations they may own. So in the case of Jeff Bezos, you know, the corporate profits made by Amazon, his share of those uh, 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 profits. Uh, how can we uh, explain those uh, results? That is, the, the received wisdom is that uh, the US tax system is very progressive, because if you look at the income tax, the bottom 50% doesn't pay that much in income tax. And then there are progressive rates, increasing rates. And it is true that the individual income tax is a progressive tax. So here it's broken down by type of tax. And indeed, you know, for the individual income tax, the, the working class doesn't pay that much. But then it increases. But even the individual income tax, the progressive individual income tax, doesn't succeed in taxing very well the very top because uh, the very uh, wealthiest Americans don't need to realize that much income. And the most striking example that we can give in the book, because uh, there is data disclosed, is the case of Warren uh, Buffett. Warren Buffett has a wealth today of 80 billion. He's the third richest American uh, 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 person. And he reported that in 2015, uh, his reported income on his tax return was $10 million. Now, $10 million is a ridiculously low number relative to a wealth of $65 billion. Because if you think that wealth gives you a return of 5%, 5% of uh, $65 billion is like $3 billion. So that's his true economic income, really, if you take you know, the full profits you know, of Berkshire Hathaway attributed to him. But he reports only 10 million in uh, income taxes. So how is that possible? It's because the tax system on the income tax works on a realization basis. As long as Berkshire Hathaway doesn't pay dividend and he doesn't sell his stock, there is no uh, realized income there. And that's why his tax rates, his individual income tax rates relative to his true economic income is essentially zero. At the very top, it's the corporate tax uh, that plays uh, a big role because it's a tax you have to pay at the corporate level, you know, right there on your uh, profits. And so uh, Warren Buffett is an extreme example. We estimate, you know, based on the best data we could uh, leverage, uh, that on average, you know, the top 400 have reported incomes that are slightly less than half of their true economic income. So Warren Buffett would be a zero. Others, you know, do a lot of realized capital gains, so they will have a uh, much higher income. But by and large, they can uh, avoid the income tax. So that's one thing. And the reason why in 2018 uh, the tax system is so regressive at the top, it's because the corporate tax that you see is the main progressive tax right here has been cut dramatically by the Trump tax cut, if you were to summarize that tax reform, it's essentially dividing by two, you know, or halving uh, the federal corporate uh, 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 tax. And because that's the main tax that the super wealthy pay, you know, through their ownership of corporation, it really weakens progressivity at the top. So the other thing I want to mention is that the poor or the low income working class pay a lot because they pay payroll taxes, as you know, those 15%, they start on the first dollar of earnings. And they pay also a lot in consumption taxes that are administered at the state and local level. And that's a regressive form of taxes because the lower your income, the higher uh, 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 the share of your income you are going to use for uh, buying goods on which you know the, the sales tax apply. Official statistics don't capture uh, consumption taxes because official statistics capture only the federal taxes. And that, in our view, you know, that's an incomplete and therefore misleading uh, view of the overall tax system. Now, we've gotten criticized for studying 
uh, taxes. And taxes, it's true, are only half of government operations. Once you've raised those taxes, hopefully you're going to do something useful, you know, for society and for people, you know, with transfers uh, back to people. And that piece is redistributive. But look, we are tax experts and we find it legitimate, you know, to uh, study the tax burden uh, itself. And that's what this book uh, is, uh, is about. But we are not saying that we are capturing all government uh, operations. Uh, so this is uh, what I have uh, explained. To uh, another thing I, I want to mention and that we uh, describe late in the book and that is very present uh, in the political debate is the issue of funding health uh, care. So, you know, some candidates have proposed, you know, Medicare for all, which means replacing the current privatized form of funding where people, you know, working here at the university, you have to pay for your health care through your employer in a, a healthcare premium by something that would be funded uh, by uh, uh, taxes. And we, to, to, to cast light on that debate, we find it useful uh, to consider existing health insurance premium like a, a privatized poll tax that's administered by uh, employers. And so the idea is this, after Obamacare, it is mandatory to have health insurance and employers themselves now are mandated to offer health insurance if they have more than 50 workers. Now, that's an enormous cost because health insurance is so expensive, particularly in the United States. On average, it costs $13,000 per covered uh, worker. Okay, so an employer like Princeton would have to offer health insurance to all its employees 13K, and it's the same price for everybody because everybody needs health care, uh, uh, needs health care. The wealthy, the highly paid professor, and uh, the modest, you know, uh, janitorial service or uh, 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 secretary. And therefore, you can see those uh, health insurance premium as effectively uh, a tax, uh, except that compared you know, to uh, government taxes, they are not based on ability to pay. They are the same amount. The secretary pays the same as the executive because in principle, employers are going to cut your wages you know, by exactly uh, the amount of the health insurance uh, they offer. And so if you had uh, health insurance as it exists as a, a big poll tax, that's the picture you get you. So you can see that the burden on the middle class, the working class and the middle class is much higher than uh, what we think. That is, workers in the US today have to pay for their health insurance and they have to pay as a lump sum, not modulated based uh, on your earnings. Now that healthcare has grown so much, it's an unsustainable form of uh, uh, financing. And actually, you know, I was listening to Angus Deaton, who has a new book with Anne Case on the issue of healthcare, and he was explaining, you know, very consistent with that, that it creates all sorts of uh, pathologies because employers don't want to pay that 13K for their low paid workers, so they are going to outsource the services, you know, to smaller firms who don't have to provide uh, health uh, insurance. You cannot make sense of uh, the Medicare for all debate without understanding that's very un unfair form of uh, funding. Everybody needs health care. Health care is very expensive. It's crazy to ask each worker to pay full price regardless of his uh, income. For example, if you were to fund education, you know that would be a really crazy form uh, of funding. So it's a, right now it's a privatized poll tax hopefully uh, it will be replaced uh, by something based on ability to pay and that's the challenge of the uh, medicare for all uh, proposals now in terms of the time series we document so we have this uh, uh, chart that shows the evolution of uh, tax rates for the 400 richest americans since 1960 and the bottom 50 uh, percent earners and so you can see a dramatic uh, evolution while the tax rate on the bottom 50% earners increased slightly uh, over time from 20 to about 25%, uh, what is striking is that the tax rate on the top 400 came down 
uh, dramatically as the progressivity of the overall tax system uh, decreased. And in 2018, I mean, we say it provocatively, but you see, I mean, in reality, the two curves touch each other. So, but essentially today, uh, the top 400 don't pay more, you know, as a fraction of their income uh, than uh, the working class in the bottom 50%. And that's a really new and striking uh, development. If you take uh, a broader uh, picture where the data are even more solid because we have much more um, information and you compare uh, the uh, tax rate on the top 0.1% over a century and the bottom 50%. And if you add health insurance uh, to the bottom 50%, uh, you get the blue curve. Uh, you see that the uh, richest 1,000 American pay more or less uh, the same rate as the working class if you add the, 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 the health insurance uh, burden uh, on them. So uh, we uh, describe in the book what we see as two engines of inequality, decreasing uh, taxes at the top and uh, increasing uh, health costs uh, for uh, the rest. If you look uh, at historical experiences, there's no fixing inequality, and especially high-end inequality, uh, without fixing uh, taxes. So we've worked on a lot of countries over long periods of time with Piketty, you know, in what has come to be the World Inequality Lab, where we document the evolution of top incomes throughout the world and over time. And there is something really striking, uh, that is how much high uh, incomes have depends heavily on uh, the overall progressivity of the tax system, especially, uh, especially at uh, the top. Okay, so in terms of inequality, let me just show you a couple uh, numbers. So there has been a dramatic increase in income concentration in the US with the top 1% essentially doubling from like 10, 11% to about 20% uh, today. And what this graph shows you uh, is that it also uh, shows you the share of income on a pre-tax basis going to the bottom uh, 50%. And their share has come down from 20 to about uh, 12%. Uh, so it's striking on this graph to see how the two curves are mirror images uh, of each other. And that's we think it's very important because we've often been criticized for, hey, you study only the top of the distribution. Why do I care, you know, if the rich are doing that well? Well, this graph tells you, you know, you should care because what the rich have gained, uh, if it could be transferred back to the working class would be enough, you know, to fully erase uh, the uh, loss in income share, you know, from the bottom uh, 50 uh, percent. Okay, so in terms of uh, economic growth, it is really important to contrast the period from 1946 to 1980, where average income growth per year and per adult was really uniform throughout the distribution at about 2% uh, per year. It was lower only at the very top with uh, what has happened, you know, since 1980, where growth at the bottom has been very small, essentially zero or even negative at the very bottom, mediocre for uh, the middle, and really good above the macro growth of 1.4% only for uh, the top 10% and above, and really at the very top, enormously high growth uh, rates. Okay, so that's the situation on uh, inequality. So now, how can we explain uh, the long run changes in tax progressivity uh, in the US? So in this picture, uh, we show you uh, the evolution of tax progressivity. So the, the figure for 2018, I showed uh, before and we show you numbers, you know, by decade, 1950, 1960, and so on. And you what is the most uh, striking here is the enormous uh, decrease in tax rates at the very top. In, in the 1950s, top earners, really, you know, in the top 0.01% were paying 
like two thirds of their true economic income in uh, 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 taxes. And now we are down to uh, 23% uh, here. So how that um, evolution came to be, uh, they, there are three uh, main drivers of uh, declining progressivity. First, a collapse in capital uh, taxation, itself reflective changes, reflecting changes in politics and uh, ideology, and economies probably played a very big role here. In our models, you know, in many of them, or in our standard models, capital taxation is a really bad thing uh, for uh, the economy, and that view was caught up, you know, in the ideology of the broader society with the idea that anything that brings down those taxes on capital is actually a good, uh, a good thing. Then, a choice to tolerate certain forms of uh, evasion, namely a progressive tax system is going to work well only if enforcement is uh, really strong. But if you uh, lift the pedal uh, on enforcement, very quickly high income earners are going to start exploiting loopholes uh, aggressively. And what has happened is that when Reagan uh, gets elected uh, in 1980, so he inherits an individual income tax that's very progressive, but really what he does is that he lets tax avoidance uh, skyrocket with tax shelters, you know, things that created losses that you could buy to offset some uh, of your income. And then he says, look, progressive taxes don't work. Let's make a deal with the Democrats to close loophole and slash rates, and the rate went down from 70% to uh, 28%. The same story uh, was repeated with the corporate tax in over the last two decades, and you have the Trump tax cut that says, we can't tax corporations uh, anymore, we need a much lower rate to be able uh, to uh, retain uh, profits uh, in, the, uh, 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 in the United States. But what we're arguing is that that's globalization in its current form, tax havens and tax competition, but other choices are uh, possible. So the one graph I want to show, because it's not very well uh, understood or it's been forgotten, if you look at the tax rate on the top 0.1%, uh, broken down by types uh, of taxes, you can see that what was really making uh, the US tax system very progressive was an enormous corporate uh, tax. In the heydays of corporate taxation in the 50s and 60s, corporate taxes were taking you know, more than half of uh, economic uh, profits. And because the wealthy typically or high income earners at stock, they were paying uh, a lot uh, in taxes. Corporate taxes have slowly come down and they really, you know, come down a lot uh, uh, recently. The individual income tax with its super high tax rate wasn't, uh, I mean, it was important, but it was not really the place where the rich were paying taxes because uh, the rates were so high that the, the wealthy were avoiding, you know, realizing income, but they were paying taxes uh, you know, at source through uh, the corporate tax. So that's why in net uh, the tax rate uh, was, uh, was very high. Uh, on the corporate side, I, I want to, so, so giving you, you know, using the work of uh, Gabriel Zuckman, uh, letting tax evasion uh, fester, the case of the corporate tax is really striking. Back in the 60s, US multinationals were booking a very small share of their foreign profits in tax havens, you know, less than 10%. And you can see that over time, that has increased uh, dramatically so that today, if you look at US multinationals, over half of their foreign profits are booked in a very low tax uh, jurisdiction. So essentially, uh, the corporate tax, uh, the way it works, it lets big multinational companies to decide where they are going to uh, report uh, their profits, and then they can buy accounting services that are going to structure uh, their finances so that the profits are reported in uh, the low tax uh, places. But what is striking is that, so that's the black curve here, profits have moved 
to tax havens because we let corporations tell us, you know, where uh, their profits are made, but workers and capital have moved uh, much uh, less. So it's not exactly, you know, the tax competition story that Ireland with its low rate is able to attract businesses, buildings, you know, workers, capital. It mostly attracts paper uh, profits because it's a lot easier in the current system to move uh, paper uh, paper profits. And so uh, we think that this development in the global uh, uh, corporate tax system is really important because there can be no progressive income taxation uh, without a high enough uh, corporate tax rate. So the idea is that if the corporate tax rate is low enough, like 21% uh, today, wealthy individuals essentially will incorporate their uh, finances and they will pay just the 21% corporate tax rate and as long as they don't need the money to consume uh, they are going uh, they are not going to be uh, 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 hit by the individual income tax you know so Warren Buffett is uh, an, an extreme example of that where he was already incorporated you know even before the Trump uh, tax cut but you're going to see a lot more movement uh, uh, in uh, that uh, direction now, how do we uh, solve uh, the problem? And so uh, our approach has three uh, key principles, you know, so reconcile globalization with tax justice. And we propose, you know, a plan to stop corporate tax evasion and tax competition, protect democracy by taxing uh, extreme uh, wealth. We think that extreme wealth represents uh, power and power, you know, to influence not only the economic system, but also uh, the political uh, uh, system. And three, uh, we also discuss issues of how to fund healthcare and education in a way that would be uh, fairer and uh, more sustainable. Now, those are our ideas. Many other possible solutions uh, are possible. And uh, you can uh, you can play with this on the uh, on the on the on the website. So let me say one thing about corporation because uh, the consensus view, at least you know, among you know international uh, institutions, is that uh, it's impossible uh, to tax corporations, multinational corporations, because they can essentially choose where they are going to. Uh, report uh, their profits, but our view is that that's a very narrow and misleading uh, views. There are relatively simple way that you can restructure corporate taxes to make sure uh, multinationals uh, pay. And one idea uh, we have actually building on uh, U.S. experience, the U.S. could tell you know it's U.S. Uh, multinationals. We are going to apply a 25% minimum tax on country by country profit. So for example, if Apple pays 2% on the profits it books in Ireland, which is roughly uh, true today, uh, the US would collect the missing uh, 23%. Uh, uh, that essentially, you know, this solution is hard uh, to uh, avoid because multinational corporations have books where they report, you know, their global profits and how they choose to allocate them across countries, but the profits have to go somewhere. And if you can track, as the IRS currently does, you know, knows for each multinational how much global profits they have and how much it's booked in each country and how many taxes are paid in each country, this type of remedial uh, taxation that we describe uh, could be, uh, could be uh, 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 implemented. Uh, let me, I mean, I, I'll be happy to take more questions on corporate taxes, but let me say a few things about uh, wealth taxation that has came back uh, into uh, the debate. So what we describe in the book, you know, where we, where we have historical uh, elements is that the U.S. actually pioneered uh, wealth taxation. That is, <clears throat> if you look at the northern uh, colonies, they had actually wealth taxes as far back as the 17th century, and those wealth taxes, strikingly, were, were not only on real estate, 
but also financial assets and other personal uh, 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 property. And it's only later on in the 20th century that those state wealth taxes were transformed into uh, the property taxes uh, that we know uh, today. So the US has a wealth tax today, but it's a wealth tax on the middle class and it's called uh, the property tax and it affects only, it's based only on real estate and it applies, you know, no matter how wealthy you might otherwise uh, be. Uh, so uh, the U.S. also, you know, what is uh, often forgotten, but uh, the country that invented uh, very progressive taxation is actually the United States. So the United States didn't invent the concept of income taxation or uh, uh, inheritance taxation, but it was the first country to crank up rates to levels uh, that were inimaginable just a few years uh, before, you know. Uh, the tax rate on, uh, top tax rate on estates went over 70% in 1936. As early as during World War I, the US experience with income tax rates above 60% and then at 90% and more uh, uh, tax rates for a long uh, 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 period of time, there were serious discussions uh, under, you know, the, the Roosevelt administration to really impose a legal maximum uh, uh, income by essentially having 100% tax rates above uh, some uh, income levels. Let's not forget that the U.S., you know, was founded, uh, uh, you know, with the view uh, that we are going to found the republic and we are going to avoid uh, the issues of aristocracy, uh, oligarchy, as we could see then in the 18th century in, uh, 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 in uh, uh, Europe. So we often hear, you know, you guys want to import, you know, progressive tax ideas uh, from Europe, but in reality, it's the reverse. You know, the US is the birthplace of very progressive taxation. And if there is any action today about restoring progressive taxation, you see it a lot more in the U.S. debates as they currently exist, as what you would see, uh, for example, in France, where, for example, which just abolished uh, its, uh, uh, its wealth tax, okay? So, so in terms of uh, wealth uh, taxation for the 21st century, so you've, you've heard, I'm, I'm sure you know about the proposals uh, made by uh, Elizabeth Warren, a 2% tax on wealth above 50 million, 3%, uh, above uh, 1 billion, and then Senator Sanders proposed an even more progressive uh, wealth tax that starts at 1% and goes to very, very high rates that we've never seen on an annual basis actually uh, anywhere. You know, 5% above 1 billion, all the way to 8% uh, above uh, uh, 10 billion. And so, uh, what is striking is just to show you how just adding uh, the wealth tax component uh, dramatically would change uh, the picture of U.S. Uh, tax uh, progressivity. So here I have the 2018 uh, tax rates that you've seen uh, before. In white, you add the Warren wealth tax, 2 and 3%. And you can see that already the rate on the top 400 doubles from 23 to uh, 46 uh, percent and then the Sanders wealth tax, you know, with its rate five, six, seven, and eight, and that triples uh, the rate to um, over uh, seventy uh, percent. And it's it is something that you can play with in our tax uh, simulator. But because there is so much wealth in the very top of the income distribution, by putting wealth taxes, you dramatically alter the picture in a way that is very hard to achieve with other tax tools uh, that have limitations, as I have discussed, you know, for the individual income tax and uh, the corporate uh, tax. Now, would that destroy uh, the U.S. Uh, economy? Uh, what we've done is a little retrospective uh, exercise. So in white here, you have the share of wealth going to the Forbes uh, 400 since 1982 when they started, you know, composing uh, those lists. And you can see uh, 
that in 1982, the Forbes 400 had slightly less than 1% of total US wealth. Now it's climbed to almost 3.5%. Uh, and now you can ask the question, if a wealth tax, you know, as proposed by Warren or Sanders had been in place since 1982, how would have uh, top wealth uh, evolved? And so what you can see is that with the Warren wealth tax, uh, their share would have grown less. You know, instead of being 3.5, they would be something like 2%. And with the Sanders wealth tax, they would be like 1.4%. Uh, but perhaps what is the most striking uh, on this graph is that even the enormous taxes, uh, wealth taxes proposed uh, by Sanders, wouldn't have stopped the increase in wealth concentration. I mean, with Sanders, you get almost flat, but not quite yet. So it shows you that very high wealth is growing, you know, so fast that even if you put significant wealth taxes, you know, 5% uh, per year, they still beat the wealth tax in some way and keep growing, although, you know, not as fast as they would, uh, 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 as they do, you know, without uh, the wealth tax. Does it abolish uh, billionaires? Uh, no, it doesn't. Even, you know, so for example, Jeff Bezos in 18, before his divorce, you know, was worth 160 billion. With the Warren Wealth tax, you know, in place since 1982, it would still be worth 87 billion. And with the Sanders, 43 uh, billion dollars. You know, when Senator Sanders saw that, he was a little bit disappointed. He thought his wealth tax would abolish billionaires. Uh, you can see that it's not. It's not quite enough, and uh, the, why it's it's relatively easy to understand, you know. So those those people at the very top of the list, uh, they become phenomenally successful by developing new businesses, and their wealth in the uh, growing phase, you know, grows uh, at very very high rates, you know, like 20, 30 percent per year, you know, sustained over 15, 20 years. That's how they become. Uh, multi-billionaires, you take 5% out of that and they still grow and become uh, uh, billionaires. But you can see that the wealth tax does play a role. That is, if you take a very mature uh, billionaire like, uh, for example, Warren Buffett, who's been a billionaire, you know, for many decades, with the uh, Warren, uh, sorry, with the Sanders wealth tax, his wealth, you know, would be divided by 10 because he would have had to pay, you know, that 5% tax for literally, you know, many, uh, many decades. So the wealth tax, if you want, doesn't uh, abolish billionaires or young billionaires because those guys can beat, you know, the wealth tax. But once you are a mature billionaire and your wealth is not growing quite as fast, the wealth tax is going to erode you uh, faster and you are going to come down faster than you would have uh, without, uh, without the wealth tax. Okay, so let me uh, uh, cut uh, 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 skip this and let me just take uh, a few minutes uh, that I have left to talk about uh, taxjusticenow.org, uh, which is a tool uh, that is what, what we think a, 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 an essential companion uh, to uh, the book. So in the book, we discuss the current tax situation, we offer some avenues uh, for uh, reforms, but we wanted uh, to give the broader public, you know, citizens, uh, tools to understand taxes better and understand how various tax proposals map into changing, you know, the profile of tax uh, 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 progressivity. And so, uh, we are going to compute, you know, effective tax rates and then allow people to modify uh, the tax system. So that's how the, the website uh, looks like and you can go on it uh, right now. And so what you can do is that you start from the current tax system as uh, it uh, exists, but then you have uh, sliders uh, here or you can pick a plan and the plan creates, you know, the wealth tax here of Senator Warren, and you immediately see how the wealth tax modifies the profile of tax rates relative to the current situation, and immediately how much it gets you in uh, extra uh, revenue. So that tool 
was developed a, a little bit you know, through our advising of campaigns. We realized campaigns are actually not well equipped to know, you know those numbers, because it's kind of a complex process to get the government to run numbers for you. you know, the agencies are supposed to work for Congress and the administration, not necessarily uh, for candidates. So they lack uh, 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 tools you know, to quickly come up with numbers. And as we were running some numbers for them, we realized that's uh, what uh, they uh, 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 would need. Now, you crank up the wealth tax you know, sliders and you immediately see uh, how much extra you, know, you can get and how uh, enormously more you know, uh, progressive uh, the current tax system uh, can be. Now, you can not only work on the wealth tax, but you can do individual income tax, corporate tax, estate tax, uh, 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 etc. You can uh, download uh, results of your simulations, engage uh, with policymakers. You, we also use the tool to model uh, the tax proposals of uh, each candidate with the information that is currently uh, publicly uh, available. And so this is the chart uh, we get from our tool. So Trump, that is the current tax system, is in red. And that one includes healthcare uh, as a tax, because that's the only way we think you can make sense, you know, of the Medicare for all reform. So Joe Biden has a plan to increase, various plans actually, to increase taxes on the rich. Here it doesn't look like it moves the needle that much. But it's because, you know, the, 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 the y-axis goes to 100%. And that's what you need, you know, to make sense of the Sanders uh, 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 plan. <laughs> uh, but the Joe Biden plan is roughly speaking, you know, going back to uh, what we had under uh, Obama, but without increasing taxes at all on the middle class. You know, campaigns are very, very concerned about, uh, 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 about that aspect. Now, Warren taxes the rich a lot more, and that's mostly through our wealth tax. Bernie Sanders is the most extreme, and he achieves a, a tax rate of 97% on billionaires. So understand, this is not a marginal tax rate. Doesn't mean that if Bezos makes an extra million, he has to pay 97% of that to uh, 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 the IRS. What this reflects is the weight of the wealth tax. It is Jeff Bezos is so rich, that he has to pay, you know, like a seven, eight percent wealth tax just to start with, even before he's earned a single dollar. And so to beat that wealth tax liability, he needs a lot of income. If he achieves a return on wealth of seven, eight percent, it can just come even, you know, with the wealth tax. So that's why you uh, achieve uh, such uh, an enormous uh, uh, tax rate. So the reason why Sanders and Warren are different here, it's because they abolish uh, private health insurance premiums, which means, so typically the, the way it would work is that employers such as Princeton University would convert existing premia paid by the university and by the worker into extra wages so that the, the labor cost doesn't change uh, for Princeton. And so that's why, you know, you abolish that private taxes in extra wages and the, the middle class, you know, pays a lot less, but you have to fund those things and therefore you need some uh, taxes, you know. So Bernie Sanders has created actually a lot of taxes uh, that would be able to fund uh, that Medicare for all. Warren looks like low taxes because her current plan is currently not enough to pay, you know, for all those uh, existing, you know, uh, healthcare uh, a, a premium. And so if you run uh, the Warren uh, 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 Wells plan, you will see that she comes out, you know, with a deficit of 2% of national income. That is, her taxes on the rich are not yet sufficient to fully uh, pay for healthcare. It's not that far. It's only, you know, two points of national uh, income. So the campaign is uh, 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 thinking, of course, about those things. But here, you don't have to wait. You can go online and crank up taxes, you know, however uh, you want to complete uh, 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 your favorite uh, candidate uh, tax uh, uh, plan. So let me uh, conclude. If you want to remember one thing from our book, 
is that uh, the widely held view that external or technical constraints make tax justice impossible uh, is wrong. Technically, nothing in globalization uh, prevents progressive uh, taxation. Tolerating tax evasion is a choice that you can make you know, by regulating uh, uh, the tax avoidance industry and having a tax code that's uh, well written and uh, well enforced. There's no uh, determinism here. There's an infinity of possible future policy uh, path. That is, you can see Trump being reelected, the corporate tax entrenched at 21%, lots of wealthy people you know, moving their finances, and that's essentially uh, the collapse of uh, progressive taxation. You can see you know, uh, candidates that have proposed very bold ideas and really reshaping uh, the profile uh, uh, of uh, uh, taxation. Uh, you know, the U.S. has gone before through those big uh, movements. That is, before the start of the individual income tax, economists thought it would never work. You know, first, it's not constitutionally allowed. You need to change the constitution. That's such a, 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 a difficult hurdle. But nevertheless, you know, within some years uh, it happened once the income tax existed the u.s quickly played with the numbers you know and cranked up rates very high you know effectively reshaping and inventing uh, progressive taxation uh, in uh, the 20th uh, century so uh, in terms of our role economists we think it's putting together data tools so that people can make sense uh, of taxes and then on a more technical uh, level, we like uh, to uh, call ourselves, you know, uh, plumbers uh, to fix the leaks in the income tax uh, uh, system. And so, you know, Esther Duflo uh, won the Nobel Prize. Uh, it was just a, a week, uh, a, a, a week ago, and she had a famous paper, you know, in her AEA early lecture where she was thinking, let's think about ourselves as uh, plumbers, tinkering, you know, with that what exists, playing around, you know, with uh, 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 the system. In the case of taxes, the uh, analogy is really apt. You know, here, literally, we are going uh, to have to fix leaks and work, you know, in the expertise, you know, to develop uh, tax plans uh, that are going to be uh, uh, air or water uh, uh, tight. So thank you uh, uh, very much. I'm very happy to, uh, uh, to take questions. Okay, so we're going to do, uh, we're going to take questions now. I think you've all received some um, pieces of paper where you can write the questions. I'm going to receive those. I'll, I'll start out with a question of my own while people will be around to collect your questions, and I will get them. So I think I, I was just there. Right? Uh, hello. Does it do anything? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, okay, so I already have. Okay, let me start you out with um, one question, Emmanuel. Um, so we're all um, schooled in the idea of the trade-off between equity and efficiency. Um, and in this school of thought, uh, you know, um, questions about redistribution, redistributive tax policy um, ends up being a fight about the size of the elasticity. Um, you do talk a little bit about that in your book, but not very much, not as much as we used to, and you didn't say a lot about it um, today. Um, and I have a couple of questions related to that, or two sort of sub-questions to that. I mean, um, for you know, and just, you know, your, your um, simulations with, um, uh, the Forbes 400 uh, wealth shares, or was it income shares, the, 
the, the predictions of that is based on a purely mechanical simulation, if I understand it correctly. There are no behavioral responses there. You mentioned that um, Bernie Sanders was disappointed that he didn't get rid of the billionaires under that proposal, but he might if there's an elasticity. Um, and so that leads to my question, uh, my two questions. Well, first, the first one is, have we just been too focused on uh, the size of the elasticity and this trade-off between equity and efficiency? Um, that's one. And the other one is that it wasn't fully clear for me in the way you presented this, um, whether we should focus on after-tax income inequality or before-tax in income inequality. Traditionally, we would always think about after-tax inequality and consumption. Um, but it seems to me that you are not only focused on that, that you see before-tax inequality as a problem in and of itself. The interesting thing about that is that totally turns the equity efficiency trade-off on its head. All of a sudden, the elasticity becomes a good thing um, because that's going to reduce before-tax income shares uh, even more. So I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Okay, so so th those are very good uh, uh, questions. So about the uh, elasticities, that is the idea that uh, if you put some taxes in there, people are going to change uh, their uh, their behavior. And Henrik and myself and colleagues have a long history of working out those uh, things. So uh, my view on that is that. Uh, and that's following, you know, what uh, uh, Joel Slamrod at Michigan had, had developed, you know, as a, a, as a concept. It's very important to distinguish uh, behavioral responses that are made just to avoid, elude, evade taxes versus real changes in economic behavior, like I work less or I save less. On the avoidance uh, evasion front, uh, my conviction, looking at a lot of data, lots of experiences, is that uh, the level of avoidance and evasion uh, may change with taxes, but and might be higher, you know, if taxes are higher. But that view, you know, is too narrow. You have to take into account that governments can do a lot, you know, to reduce tax avoidance, uh, evasion. Uh, op op opportunities. And if you want to do progressive taxation, obviously you want to have, you know, as part of the reform, a crackdown on uh, evasion and uh, avoidance. So that's why the concept of people will respond, that's true in a narrow sense. But if you want your progressive tax to be successful, you have to do things to uh, protect uh, from those responses. And again, you know, and we, that's something we describe in the book. It's really striking to see uh, how Ronald Reagan did it. Uh, in 1981 and 82, he cut taxes on the rich, you know, with a top rate from 70 to 50 percent. But at the same time, he allowed uh, tax avoidance to fester, you know, through the development of those tax shelters. So you have a situation where tax rates are come, have come down. But the message coming from the top is that it's fair game, you know, it's legitimate, it's the moral thing to do to avoid uh, paying taxes so that you can keep, you know, uh, your uh, earnings and evasion avoidance explodes, even though tax rates have come down. So in historical experiences, uh, with progressive taxes come anti-avoidance measures. So a fixed elasticity is not very helpful. Now, we'll... Uh, people, you know, change uh, their uh, behavior if there were a wealth tax. That's a good question. It's actually a very hard one uh, to answer. That is, if I were to ask people in this room, you know, perhaps young people with brilliant ideas of how to develop businesses uh, for the future, if you were to see, you know, that Jeff Bezos uh, was only 43 billion instead of 160, or Zuckerberg, a younger guy, 29 instead of 61, would you be discouraged? Uh, you know, instead of trying to develop uh, the next Facebook, you would choose, you know, a boring academic career like us, you know. Uh, uh, you know, so the bottom line is that it, it's hard to know. Economists like to think. Uh, they know how to estimate those things. I think 
We don't know that much. It probably depends on how society is structured. Thankfully, in human societies, you know, people are motivated to work over and above uh, the pure uh, financial uh, uh, financial uh, incentive. So now, on the question of how to measure inequality pre-tax, after tax, that comes back to the what I alluded to, you know, in my presentation. Governments take, you know, taxes, you know, about 28% of national income in the U.S., then we use those taxes to fund a number of things, you know, direct transfers, public goods, various other things that benefit people. So it's interesting to know, uh, does that, is that useful, you know, to reduce inequality? And indeed, in our academic papers, we had looked at the full picture. And it's true that if you look on a after-tax plus transfers uh, basis, there is less uh, inequality than on a pre-tax uh, than on a pre-tax basis. But what I want to point out is that for the very rich, it doesn't dramatically alter the picture because for them, the transfers they receive from the government are not that large relative to their economic income. So for them, looking at the tax picture is really where uh, the action uh, is. My first question here, or someone's first question, which uh, links well to something you were just talking about. Over 60% of those on Forbes 400 richest Americans are self-made. Why is this injustice? That's a very good uh, question. So, you know, you look, you look at that list. You see Jeff Bezos, 160, and it's true, almost all of them uh, kind of grow uh, their uh, fortunes, you know, by themselves, right? Amazon started from really nothing, you know, Microsoft, same thing. Berkshire Hathaway was a small thing. The only uh, inheritor is Jim Walton, you know, who uh, is worth 45 billion, who inherited, you know, the Walmart business from, uh, I think uh, it was his father, but the, the business was grown, you know, the generation uh, 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 before. So. Is that, is that fair uh, or not? So you can answer the, the question at different levels, depending on how left uh, you are. Uh, the, the one thing uh, you can say is like, maybe they deserve you know, uh, their fortune, but our point is that perhaps they should pay a tax rate no lower uh, than what the working class is paying. Currently, you know, if our numbers are right, because they can, they pay only the corporate tax, they don't have to realize income, they pay less. Perhaps, you know, it, it's not a very high threshold, you know, for a majority of people to think that's, uh, that's unfair. Now, if you're more left, you know, you can go uh, beyond that and say, yes, they struck it rich, uh, but, you know, you know there are constantly new inventions uh, coming up and it has to be somebody, right, who uh, makes, uh, that invention without Jeff Bezos, I don't know how the world would look like, but maybe there would have been another online giant, online, you know, uh, retailer, Facebook. I mean, you can think whatever you want about, about it. Perhaps it could have been structured in another way. Microsoft, you know, same thing, you know, if you hate your PC and stuff, you know, maybe it could have been better. I don't know, uh, open source, it's, it's very hard. Uh, 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 it's very hard to know there is something that is almost, you know, chance, you know, you are in a complex system, somehow you are there at the right time, at the right point, you make an enormous uh, 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 fortune, it's a big society, millions, billions of uh, customers, I don't think it makes sense to say, you know, the person, you know, uh, deserves every last dollar. And then the even more left is that you are worried. You look here, you know, the Koch uh, 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 brothers, one of, one of which, you know, passed away recently. And you see they were willing to spend $900 million in 2016 in the elections. And you are worried, wow, that much money, it really means I'm going to have a big uh, influence. And maybe uh, that's, I don't want so much concentration of wealth so that there isn't quite as much. Uh, concentration of power. The bottom line is that I'm not going to give you the answer. It's for you, the people, to uh, decide uh, uh, where you are and then see which policy you, you support. Um, 
there are several questions having to do with the enforceability and implement, implementability of the wealth tax. Uh, so let me just read out loud a few of them. Haven't numerous other countries tried wealth taxes but then abandoned them, presumably because they were hard to administer and didn't yield that much revenue? And here's another one. A wealth tax is a new and complicated system. Why not reform the income tax system, uh, eliminate, uh, eliminate deductions, uh, loopholes, raise tax rates, uh, et cetera, to, receive, uh, to achieve the same uh, objective? And if I can add to those two questions, specifically, you know, alternative proposals have to do with fixing, as you know, the estate tax, eliminating stepped up basis, uh, and features like that that are currently um, undermining uh, estate taxation. Yes. Okay, so those are very good questions. L let me answer the, the first one uh, on the European ex uh, experience. It's true that, by and large, wealth taxes in Europe uh, have failed. So why would it succeed in the, in the United States? We wrote a long paper, you know, for the Brookings uh, conference uh, on this. And uh, our view is that the European wealth taxes had three major uh, flaws uh, that can be overcome in the US situation. The first one is that the tax was based on residence, meaning that if you're a wealthy person in Paris, by moving to London, the year after you were no longer liable for the wealth tax because in Europe taxes are based on residence. In the US system works very differently. Uh, the tax is based on citizenship. No matter where you live as a US person, you remain liable for US taxes with full credits for taxes you pay. Uh, abroad, uh, where you live. On top of that, there is an exit tax where essentially you have to pay a big one-time wealth tax if you leave the country and the, the proposals uh, out there make that exit tax even bigger. Okay, So in the case of uh, the United States, once you're already rich, it'd be very hard to uh, escape the wealth tax by moving. Well, in Europe, that was that concern. It was easy uh, to move. The second is that the US is in a much stronger position uh, now to uh, crack down on uh, offshore tax uh, evasion. While it was easy in Europe uh, to put money in Swiss banks, uh, and that with bank secrecy, you know, would never be reported to your home country, let's say uh, that France. The Obama administration passed a very important regulation in 2010 uh, you know, the FATCA, it's called. The acronym is a Foreign um, Account Tax Compliance Act. But think about FATCA, uh, uh, you know. Uh, and the idea is there is that any foreign financial institution has to report to uh, the IRS account balances for any US person subject to heavy penalties on the institution itself, you know, if it fails uh, to do so. So you see a, one big country really scared off all those foreign financial institutions, making it a lot harder for US people to uh, evade taxes through offshore tax evasion. That's something Europe never had. The third flaw is that uh, the European wealth tax started around 1 million. At 1 million or 2 million, you have a lot of people with essentially real estate wealth. So I own a house in the countryside in France. It's a touristic uh, destination. Maybe that thing, my house is now worth, you know, 1.5 million, but my income is very low. So it creates situations with hardship, not unlike the US property tax. You know, prices increase, the property tax. Uh, increases and it creates revolts. You know, in California, we had that, we know, with Proposition uh, uh, 13. And in, in any case, there were many examples that people from the right could point out. Here is a modest homeowner, low income, clobbered, you know, by the wealth tax. Henry gave me example of castle owners uh, in Denmark that were prominent in the debate. The U.S. wealth tax is very different because it starts at 50 million. Once you are above 50 million, you no longer find people you know that are totally liquid. I mean, if you believe in financial market, if you have a collateral of 50 million, you can generate 
uh, liquidity, to pay the wealth tax, which means that it's going to be very hard to find examples of uh, a person who is under hardship because they have 100 million in assets and they cannot pay you know, the 1 million they owe under the uh, Warren uh, wealth tax. Uh, I had a question about why not the income tax? And I'm saying, yes, uh, you can, but play with our tool and crank up you know, the income tax rates and you get, you know, in the Joe Biden type of uh, scenario, you see they don't work that well to crank up tax rates that much. It's almost intoxicating. Once you play with the wealth tax levers, you can see, wow, I can really <laughs> move up uh, those tax rates uh, 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 a lot. So you see, you know, if the wealth tax is well enforced, it is much more powerful actually to increase the effective tax rates relative to, to income. Okay, here's a question um, about pension income. So you include non-realized capital gains as income, um, but pension seems somewhat analogous for lower income groups since they, all, they represent future okay. income. Okay, careful here. Misunderstandings from the Twitter wars. <laughs> uh, uh, look, I mean, we are experts on inequality and taxes. Hopefully we've done a good job. You know, if we are good academics, you hope, you know, that we've done uh, 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 a good job and time will tell. You know, it might take more than a week, you know, to settle uh, the debate. But in our income measure, we have essentially a true economic income as measured in national accounts. And in particular, you know, if you own corporations, the profits made by those corporations are income uh, to you. Unrealized gains, which means the increase in the value of your assets relative to how you uh, started with them is a stock and it's not part of our denominator, okay? And uh, 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 pensions, pensions are included in the denominator uh, because otherwise the elderly look like they have zero factor income because they are retired so they no longer have labor income. They might have a little bit of pension wealth, but that the capital income on that is relatively small. So to make sense of uh, a distribution, you know, that makes sense for the full population, including the elderly, you have to look at income after the operation of the pension system. So that's what we do. I mean, it's kind of a technical question. We did it, you know, through uh, a hard uh, 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 thinking, we are willing to debate you, but you know, don't believe you know a, a tweet that says they are crazy. You know, they you know they made a crazy assumption there. Okay. I think we've thought about it carefully. Um, I wanted to just um, uh, pose a question um, related to some things you've talked about already, namely the whole uh, benefit side uh, of things. So, so you show. Um, uh, strikingly, how the U.S. is sort of this is is, is, a, is a flat tax system, uh, with some regressive regressivity at the top, but but by and large a flat tax system, and um, and I know in the debate surrounding your book, people have pointed out, well, you know, the expenditure side is progressive. Um, I think it's interesting to add sort of an international perspective to this because my sense is that if you look at um, a number of countries in Europe they're in fact also essentially flat tax systems if we focus just on the tax side. It's not so much the progressivity of the tax system that's the difference, it's rather the differences are twofold. One is that the European flat tax is a flat at a much higher level. And then those flat tax collects an enormous amount of revenue which is spent way more progressively uh, than they are in the US. Um, so that leads to my sort of two sub questions. First of all, it's just, well, first of all, it's a common, which I actually think once we include the benefit side, it's gonna make you even stronger in terms of comparisons with other countries. Um, um, but also kind of what do you think about the benefit side? So it's fine that we, we collect all this revenue at the top from Warren Buffett and uh, Jeff Bezos and the like, uh, but a question is how do we spend it? The redistributive effect will depend on whether we spend this on means-tested welfare programs or health insurance or education? I, yes, no, so I, I, I agree uh, with what you say. It's true that if you look European countries and actually I had written a book with Thomas Piketty, you know, 10 years ago 
about the tax system uh, in France. And you're right that that picture, you know, there of a big flat tax is also kind of true uh, in France, except that the level, instead of being 28, it's more like 45%. Uh, uh, percent with also some regressivity, you know, at the, at the very top. But the difference is that uh, certainly, yes, uh, in France, for example, healthcare is funded, you know, through taxation, which means that people are going to pay for it based more or less on their ability to pay. In the US, for workers, that's not the case. Currently, you know, the worker is going to have to pay full price through the employer, but effectively it's the worker uh, who pays regardless of uh, his salary. And that's the, on the transfer side, you know, that's the most, the biggest uh, uh, inequity. So that's why wisely, you know, the, I mean, the, the debate is a lot about uh, Medicare for. Now, on the rich themselves, what I want to point out, you know, with this historical graph is that, yes, the US used to tax uh, the rich a lot more, a lot more, you know, than uh, uh, European countries ever did. And that question is a legitimate one, especially in our situation where income and wealth has concentrated uh, so much. But you would hope that uh, eventually, you know, if you do very progressive taxes and you have, again, a leveling of income and wealth concentration, that issue of uh, taxing the super rich might not be so much, you know, front and center of the uh, economic debate. And we can talk about what the government is doing. Should it be done by the government? How it should be uh, funded? So, by the way, I'm assuming someone is sort of giving me, and I don't know where we are with time. I think one last question. One last question? Uh, okay, let's take this one, um, which is basically, how do you feel about a VAT? Should the US adopt ah, a VAT? Very good question. Uh, the VAT, actually, you use our simulator and you can <laughs> do a, a VAT. And so my, my, the, the bad news I have for you is that a VAT is not quite as, it's, it, the conservatives like to paint it as a flat tax, but it's a flat tax actually on consumption and not, not even all consumption because it excludes big chunks of the economy. It doesn't tax, you know, the financial sector doesn't tax education, doesn't tax healthcare. So essentially it's a tax on about half of uh, 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 consumption. And because low income folks, you know, consume more of their income than the high income folks, it doesn't look quite as bad as the gray here, but uh, not so much better either, you know? So it's, it's, it's not quite as regressive, but it is uh, uh, pretty, uh, pretty regressive. In terms of very broad, truly flat tax, we have a proposal in the book that we call a national income tax that would tax all labor compensation and all profits of companies uh, that would essentially capture uh, most of national income. So instead of having a VAT with a base of like half of national income, you would have 90% of national income and based on an income basis, it looks uh, really, uh, 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 really flat. But it's a tax on everybody and the candidates are anxious to increase taxes, you know, on the middle class. So, you know, you might not hear much uh, about such broad flat taxes in the current, uh, in the current situation. Okay, so thank you so much, Manuel, for an intriguing presentation. <laughs>